My Gavanan Melonin, and well met indeed. I am Arahir Galadirthan, head of the modding team behind Divide and Conquer, but welcome to another lore video. Today, dealing with the brother, if you will, the twin, the sister, call it what you will, of Isengard, and that is, of course, the Fortress of Aglorond, or as most people colloquially call it, Helm's Deep. Before we get in, though, of course, I must first thank those who again have um, risen to the, the rank of Banner Marshal in, in um, the Discord and indeed on Patreon. And this month, my thanks go to a gentleman simply known as James. So thank you very much to you for your ongoing support and indeed to all who continue to support the channel. Your thanks, uh, my thanks rather, <laughs> are given to you. So, starting with the names, as we always do, the chief name of Helm's Deep until a certain event that many of you will be aware of, but it's primary name was Soothberg, which literally just means Southern Fortress, and of course is um, an Anglo-Saxon-inspired Saxon name, as many of you will be aware. Berg is a common name for fortress or walled town or something along those lines. And Sooth obviously just means South. The um, location as a whole was also for a very long time known as the Fortress of Aglorond, and Aglorond is the name of the glittering caves, and it literally means glittering caves or caves of glory. So it's the fortress at that location is the other name that it is often given. But finally, the chief name of the actual keep, the fortress section of um, Helm's Deep, uh, is the Hornburg, which is a name given to it through links to Helm's Horn. Uh, Helm Hammerhand will come up, of course, in this video later on, and it is he who gives his name to Helm's Deep, but it is his horn that gives its name to the Hornburg. Throughout the entirety of this video, I will be calling it Helm's Deep. Uh, it is the most well-known name, it is the easiest to describe the whole thing, and so we're going to stick with Helm's Deep. The final name that many of you may not be aware of is a name that the Rohirrim gave to the Glittering Clay Caves in their own language, and that is Glimeshrafu, uh, which is not spelt like that in any way, uh, but it's an interesting old, again, Anglo-Saxon inspired name, and again literally just means Caves of Glory, or uh, rather, sorry, Glittering Caves. So the description of Helm's Deep, then the location that makes up Helm's Deep is made up of various geographical features. Firstly, the entire location is found within a great coombe in the mountains. That may be a word unfamiliar to some of you, but this is like a, a bay, if you will. Like Consider a bay in the ocean, and imagine that, but instead of uh, being in the ocean, it's in a line of mountains. So it's a rather sharp indentation into the mountains, as though someone has scooped out part of the rock and left a wide plain behind uh, that, that eventually ends into a, that takes a form of a sort of valley almost as well. But at the back of this coombe lied, uh, lay a gorge and um, the gorge then fiddled down and filed down and eventually gives way to the glittering caves. The caves are called the Glittering Caves because the walls within them are laden with gems and veins of ore. Uh, the caves have high domed ceilings and sand covers the floor, so they're an ideal refuge as well. They're not uh, cold and damp and dark and horrid. They are a thing of beauty. And the caves themselves then open up into paths from their back that lead up into the White Mountains proper. So you can escape from Helm's Deep through the cave. It is not a prison, if you will. Turning then to the man-made defences, chief amongst these was of course the Hornburg itself, um, which was also um, known as Helm's Gate at various points throughout uh, the book. Uh, but the Hornburg sat on a spur of rock that jutted into the coombe and was named the Horn Rock. <laughs> There's a bit of a horn theme throughout, really. Uh, the keep was a large circular affair with a long sloping causeway that led up to its gate. Uh, and it also had, of course, a tall tower from which its namesake could be heard all about the coombe, because Helm's horn was placed at the top of the tower, and from there the sound could be heard as right out to the um, plains of the Westfold beyond. The keep did not connect to the caves, and if someone was trapped inside the keep, there would be no escape. So behind the wall, the deeping wall, as we'll discover in a moment, uh, lower down, you can get into the caves and then you can get into the mountains and you can leave. But if you are in the Hornburg itself, as we will of course find out, and as many of you know, Theoden, Aragorn and Legolas were, there is no way out. They would have been trapped. But the cave, the defenders in the caves, they could have made an escape. 
Um, so that's the, the chief um, man-made fortress structure at Helm's Deep, but the fortress of Aglarond also, of course, had a long, large wall that stretched from the Hornberg all the way to the far side of the Coombe, and it covered the entrance to the gorge completely. Uh, and that the wall, however, does have one glaring weakness. Uh, the wall is, as I've already mentioned, is called the Deeping Wall. Um, but it does have one glaring weakness, and that is that the deeping stream rises in the mountains behind the wall and passes beneath it. And to allow its passage, there is a small cutout in the base of the wall that has no covering whatsoever. So if someone is able to um, wrestle their way through this admittedly shallow stream, you can just walk underneath the wall. <laughs> it's a huge... Um, defensive error, and it pays dividends, as, as we shall see later on. Uh, but the stream itself then then flows down into the Coombe and out into the Westfold to the northeast and beyond. Um, and yeah, as I say, the culvert, um, the culvert as it is known, becomes something of a problem. Finally, the defenders had also built a vast trench that stretched across the mouth of the Coombe, so further out from Helm's Deep itself, where the Coombe actually begins, so where the plains of Westfold meet Helm's Deep, there is a trench, and it stretches across the entire mouth of this wide valley area, and a rampart was built on one side of the trench, and this whole thing was known as Helm's Dyke. Uh, but it didn't have a gate. Instead, there was just a large gap. So you've got a trench on your... If you're standing in the gap, you've got a trench on your right, a trench on your left, and they both lead out right to the mountains. And behind them is a tall rampart, which is essentially just a wall. And um, But then in where you're standing, there's nothing. So to block Helm's Dyke, you'd have to make a wall of people or, or makeshift defences. There was no gate. Uh, the wall, this trench and rampart structure was a mile long from side to side uh, and it was just too vast, far too vast really to defend. The only use I would have thought of the trench and the rampart of course is to funnel your enemy into a single small point in the middle because if they know that there's a way through in the middle they're not going to try and get under over the trench and then over the rampart behind it. So it does give you some defensive strength. But um, the breach in the wall is actually quite large itself, um, and um, so it isn't the best defensive location. The whole location of Helm's Deep, so the, so the coombe, the fortress, the caves, the trench, the dike, everything, lies in the shadow of three great peaks of the White Mountains known as Three Hearn. Uh, and that is a single mountain that has three peaks, and the name pops up quite a lot if you're reading... Um, the two towers where the Tolkien talks about this a lot. So then we come on to the history of Helm's Deep. So unlike the Tower of Orthanc or the Fortress of Aglarond or Helm's Deep was built in the time of Gondor proper and not at the coming of the Numenorians. So it's a little younger than Isengard. And at the height of Gondor's power, Gondor was ruled by a group of quite skilled kings and this time period and these kings came to be known as the ship kings. So people would say in the time of the ship kings and uh, I, um, if memory serves I believe there were four of them before. Um, I think there's four but there's a break in the middle with one person who's not very good if memory serves but um, I've covered that in a, in a different video uh, in, in Gondor's histories videos. But um, And it was they who built Helm's Deep as a sister to Isengard. So Isengard is built with pure Numenorean knowledge and skill whereas Helm's Deep is watered down Numenorean skill. They've had some time to lessen themselves and become Gondorians as opposed to Numenorians. Which, um, and the, the lessening of Gondor is just through mixing their blood with the indigenous peoples who already lived in the land that became Gondor. And indeed, just spending time away from Numenor seems to have generally sapped their skill, knowledge, and, and, and desire. Uh, so Helm's Deep isn't as good as Isengard is the point, mostly shown from the fact that the Orthanc itself can't actually be damaged. The, the tower, the Ents throw themselves against the tower of the Orthanc uh, and they do no damage and Treebeard bids them to pull away lest they basically kill themselves on this impenetrable rock. But Helm's Deep is not like that. What the actual Gondorians called the fortress we simply do not know because they would not call it Soothberg because that is not their language at all. They either would have named it something Sindarin like the fortress of Aglarond which is Sindarin or they would have called it something totally different. So we don't know what the Gondorians called it um, and Helm's Deep itself after its actual construction doesn't feature in the histories at all until the coming of Aeol some 2,000 years later or a thousand or so years later. So at that time when Kalanathan was given over to the Rohirrim or the um, the Aoreds of 
of uh, the Aethio, that's who I'm after, sorry. When um, the lands of Kalanathan were given to what became the Rohirrim, unlike Isengard, Helm's Deep was given to them, and they named it Suthberg, as it guarded the southern side of the Gap of Rohan. Uh, the Suthberg slowly became the seat of the Lords of the Westfold, so um, the, the peoples that oversaw and managed the land of the Westfold, which is, of course, as the name suggests, Gondor's, uh, Rohan's western border. And from there, they maintained their watch on the Dunlendings and guarded the western edge of Rohan at the River Isen. That is until the long winter came and the leader of the Dunlendings, Wolf, usurped the throne of Rohan and claimed all but Helm's Deep for his own. I should say that uh, he did actually claim Helm's Deep, but it was held by Rohan, and perhaps Rohan's most famous king retreated there with all that he could bring. Uh, and so that is how Helm Hammerhand, one of Rohan's most famous kings, was trapped in the Suthberg and the Dunlendings laid siege. Because the Dunlendings usurped, uh, or Wolf usurped the throne at Edoras and claimed much of Rohan, and Helm Hammerhand fought a defensive retreat back to Helm's Deep, where he then lay in wait. Of course, not all of Rohan fell to Wolf, as we shall see later on. But the horn of Helm was then heard blaring out throughout the Coombe quite frequently whilst he was trapped. And each time this horn blared from the Tower of the Hornburg, fear and panic spread amongst the Dunlendings because Helm would then also accompany this horn and he would sneak out of Helm's Deep into the Coombe and he would kill random Dunlendings, often with his bare hands. Uh, he's quite a wanton murderer, to be honest, but uh, of course he murderer has bad connotations, but it's just the brutality and savagery with which Helm became famous for killing Dunlendings. Essentially on his own, he just got a mate to blow a horn at the top of the tower, and then he snuck out of the keep and he just picked off Dunlendings where he could and then came back after a night of, of successful slaying. It's just bizarre. But after a time, Helm is undone. His two sons perish in the siege, leaving none of his bloodline left, or none of his immediate children left. Um, and Helm himself perishes, but he doesn't die in the keep, no, no. He is found frozen, standing up, out in the coom itself, frozen to death. And one of his many ventures out to kill the Dunlendings, this time he perhaps went unprepared, and he perishes due to the bitter cold. And thus it comes to pass that the place then becomes Helm's Deep. And it is the, um, the strength, superiority and awe created by his horn that then gives its name to the Horn Rock, the Hornburg. So that's where the most well-known names come for the Helm, uh, for Helm's Deep. From that point forward though, Helm's Deep does not feature again in the histories of Middle-earth until the end of the Third Age, which if, again, I should have researched this, I'll probably put a note on the screen, but um, if memory serves, I think it's about 500-ish years after Helm's death that, um, that the Third Age comes to a conclusion, 3019. I'm sure it's circa 500 years, it's something like that. Uh, but I will put a note on the screen if I was wrong, uh, which I almost certainly was. But so, at the time of the War of the Ring, of course, the deeds and, and the happenings at Helm's Deep are made very famous by anyone who's read the book, of course, and the films have lent it all an, an idea of what happened. But of course, it doesn't happen as it occurs in the films, and I think it does a little... It's to the disservice of Rohan, to be honest, because the coming of the elves Apologies is slightly tangential, but a coming of the elves to Helm's Deep lessens the actual bravery, strength, and determination of the Rohirrim. They are able to fight off Isengard on their own. They are, of course, aided um, uh, um, mentally by the coming of the Huons and the um, and Fangorn Forest's wrath, because, of course, the the attackers, seeing this giant forest behind them where once there was none, that must have had a mental effect on them. But it is Rohan itself. Uh, aided, of course, by Gandalf. It cannot be, you cannot take away the effect of Gandalf on the defence um, at Helm's Deep. But anyway, let's actually talk about it rather than me just moaning about um, the elves. So, Helm's Deep, um, firmly by the time of the Third Age, was the seat of the Lord of the Westfold, who at this time was a famous gentleman called Erkenbrand, uh, and his family resided in Helm's Deep. He had quite a sizable garrison, and uh, it was a strong and well defended location. Erkenbrand saw fit to empty the majority of the defenders of Helm's Deep to march out and meet Saruman at the Fords of the Eisen. And um, the two battles of the Fords of the Eisen are fantastically interesting, and um, I will cover them in a separate video, but they're not um, wholly pertinent 
to Helm's Deep itself. So we just know that Urkenbrand left for the second battle of the Fords of the Eisen with the majority of the defenders of Helm's Deep. He left behind someone called Gamling the Old um, to to take governance of the keep whilst he was gone. Urkenbrand and Theodred are the two who lead the Rohirrim in the battles at the Fords of Eisen, and of course, as you all well know, Theodred perishes in the first, and Urkenbrand and his forces are scattered uh, in the second. Um, also, names to mention here because they are um, fantastically uh, uh, brave, and uh, their stories are very interesting, are Grimbold and Elfhelm. But uh, they, Grimbold and Elfhelm don't feature in the Battle of Helm's Deep, so when their names are in passing only. But so it was that when King Theoden and uh, his entourage with Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli and Eomer come to Helm's Deep, they find it in the charge of Gamling, as I say. But the guards of the keep are now said to mostly have seen too many winters or too few, which is, of course, a line that's quite um, prominent and famous in the film. But Gamling does say that, and he says, most have seen too many winters like me, or many have seen too few like my, uh, I think, grandson, he says, or possibly son. Yeah, no, it must be grounds and let's see not be old. So um, essentially the defenders left are the ones who weren't really able-bodied. So it's not looking too good. But the defenders' numbers, of course, are bolstered by the coming of the army of Edoras, which is led by Theoden itself. Uh, but they are still gravely outnumbered. Now, one thing I should say is that in, in my reading, and I am absolutely, I would love for someone to provide um, the source for, for the sizes, but I can't seem to find where it is listed the size of the army that Isengard sends. But we just need to know that the defenders of Helm's Deep are grossly outnumbered. Something that I have forgot to write down in the mention of the Deeping Wall is that unlike in the film where the Deeping Wall is completely smooth, straight up from bottom to top, in truth it actually acts like an overhanging cliff. And at the top of the wall it then starts jutting out. Um, and so there are crenellations and there are battlements at the very top of course, but it actually, the top of the wall is further out than the base of the wall. And uh, so it makes it very, very difficult for things like ladders or hooks to actually get up onto the Deeping Wall. And the battle itself is not really one of ladders. The defenders make their way into Helm's Deep primarily through Saruman's fire and coming through the gate into the Hornburg itself. Um, the ladders are not a key feature. Ladders obviously do um, feature, but they are nowhere near as successful as they seem to be in the film. But for the start of the battle, the defence goes relatively well, and the Uruks at first are unable to really make any ground. They come against the wall and they are beaten away. They constantly retreat. And this pattern of swelling and receding continues for some time, until the Orcs then finally start to make ground on the gate itself. And, um, and the Uruks, learning, of course, that they're coming under a hail of arrow fire and stones from the keep, they begin to form a sort of testudo formation around their battering ram, which is just a tree they felled and, sh and shaved off one of the ends. And they finally make it to the gate and they start breaking down the gate. And Aragorn leads um, a small band with Eomer as well out of a postern gate hidden from the side of the main gate up at the, uh, the Hornburg's gate. And they come upon the attackers and the, the attackers are so shocked that there's a way out of the keep that isn't the main gate. That they, uh, absolute disarray spreads between them and Aragorn and Eomer are able to beat back the attack entirely. Which buys them just enough time then to actually reinforce the gate from behind. So prior to this point there was the gate and then beyond that you just walk into the Hornburg. But now with Aragorn and Eomer's attack on the attackers they are, they're able to put debris and rock and anything they can behind the gate so that even if the gate falls you've got to then sort of start picking your way through and removing rubble just to get through. So Aragorn and Eomer are able to save the gate um, and then they, they return to the battle. But then the, this is where the main problem of the culvert comes in. For At the time of the battle, the glittering caves where all the women and children are sent. Many of Rohan of the defender's horses, because of course almost all of them have horses, this is Rohan, they are all just placed in the land behind the deeping wall. So it's just a, a flat space. And there are a few people posted amongst them to guard these horses. And the stream passes through the sort of pasture that the horses are in. And the Uruks swiftly learn that um, there's a gap in the wall. And they manage to make their way through the deeping stream. And they come upon these horses 
just out of nowhere. They slay all of the guards and they start just wantonly murdering and slaying as many horses as they can. And they even, um, if the memory serves, they they just cause complete panic amongst the, the rear guard of the Rohirrim because of course they, why would anyone come through the wall? I mean, I just don't understand this bit. Why would they not think that someone would come through the giant hole in the wall? And I appreciate it's not actually a giant hole and it is just a small outlet and you'd only get a few walks through at a time. But still, a few walks through is some walks through. I just don't understand it. Why didn't they just block it up and take the flooding that would cause? Like, you're not going to be there for months on end. I, I, I just thought it was bizarre. It seemed to me a glaring hole in the defenders, if quite literally, if you pardon the pun, uh, in the defenders' plan. But anyway, Aragorn and Gimli rally the defenders and they beat out the Uruks from the gap in the wall. And then Gamling asks Gimli to use, obviously he's a dwarf, and to all, dwarves are stereotyped as masters of stone, and now I'm sure almost all of them are masters of stone, but not literally all of them are. But anyway, Gamling says, Gimli, come on, help us block up this culvert, You're, um, you'll know what to do, you're a master of stone. And Gimli quite rightly says, well, yeah, I know what to do with stone, but I'm not going to be able to just build a wall with my bare hands. But anyway, they block up the culvert again with rubble, debris, rocks, anything they can find, and it does dam the stream and create a sort of lake area or more of a puddle really behind it but finally the culvert is covered why they didn't do that at the beginning anyone's guess morons to be honest but anyway then of course the pat's most famous thing saruman's fire at the base of the rock where the culvert is they pile up whatever Saruman's fire is, no conjecture made here on my part, and they blast open the blockage. Now a key distinction here again from the film is to note that they don't blast a giant hole in the wall, the fire is not that strong. They blast away the debris that is blocking the culvert and they open that culvert, um, the size of that gap by some considerable margin, but they don't blow a giant hole in the wall. Um, but the coming of the fire, fueled then as well by the onrush of Uruks who charged through that gap, then brings about the undoing, of course, of the defenders. And the, the Uruks stream in, again, if you'll pardon the pun, because they're running on the stream itself. Eventually as well, the gate itself falls to this blasting fire, and so the defenders were split in two. Aragorn and Legolas, who were actually fighting on the wall, are pushed back up the wall, because you can get from the Hornburg to the wall by a flight of stairs, and Aragorn and Legolas are the last to come up this stairwell before they block the gate at the Hornburg, they block the gate that leads down to the wall. Whilst Aragorn and Legolas make it to the Hornburg, Eomer, Gamling and Gimli, who were down on the plain fighting off the Uruks who were now streaming through the gap made by the fire, they are pushed back into the caves. So we've got Theoden, Aragorn, Aragorn, Aragorn and Legolas up in the Hornburg with the elite guard really, with, with Theoden's personal bodyguard and the lords of Rohan as they are described. And down in the caves, we've got all the women and children, we've got AMA, we've got Gamling, and we've got Gimli, and we've got the defenders, the, the, the rank and file Rohirrim, who are down in the caves now. Also about this time, of course, we are now closing in on night passing and dawn coming. So we've been fighting for an entire evening, but it's described in about three pages. Tolkien really doesn't give too much to the battle scenes. They're not what he wrote the books about, so it's difficult to get information for. But anyway, yeah, and this is much more turning into the Battle of Helm's Deep uh, video rather than just Helm's Deep itself. But anyway, in the morning, Aragorn actually goes up onto the battlements above the Hornburg um, and talks to the uruk and they're quite eloquent, to be honest. The film paints them in a terrible picture and makes them sound like idiots. Growling, snarling idiots, but in truth, they speak. Um, they, they can speak perfectly well. And they taunt Aragorn back and Aragorn tells them that they shouldn't be so confident basically and that if Aragorn's side have victory here not a single Uruk will leave this place. He's quite ruthless. And the uruk just laugh at him and, and Aragorn says as well the dawn is coming of course because orcs famously fear the light and they're not good in the daylight. They simply don't go out in it. Sauron famously blacks out the sun essentially at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields because his army can't fight in the day. Whereas the fighting uruk as they call themselves do not fear the dawn and uh, they have a bit of an exchange and then eventually they start firing arrows at Aragorn so he buggers back off and this is when Theoden then resolves that he's not going to die as a prisoner in the Hornburg because as you may remember there's no escape from the Hornburg the children and the women and the peoples down below and they can get out of the caves but Theoden cannot and he does, says to Aragorn ride out with me if we are gonna die let's bloody well end in glory rather than die as as weakened prisoners in this cage. And so, 
as the dawn rises and just as it hits, the horn of Helm rings clear out from the very tower of Helm's Deep itself, echoing down the valley to the mouth of the Coombe itself. And at that exact moment, Theoden, Aragorn, and the Lords of Rohan atop their um, now quite powerful horses burst out of the keep and they charge all the way to Helm's Dyke. So this is another key distinction from the film. In the film, Theoden and Aragorn, they burst out from Helm's Deep, they charge down the, ra the uh, ramp, and then they begin just fighting amongst the Uruks. And then Gandalf appears on the hill to the side, clears out the rest of the Uruks, and they all have a happy day. Whereas in truth, Theoden's charge clears out every single enemy from Helm's Deep to Helm's Dyke itself. They charge away the entirety of the Uruk army, save for those who are besieging the caves. Because at the, ch the time that Theoden charges out and as the horn blares out amongst the Deeping Coombe, Gimli, Eomer, Gamling and all of their defenders seize the opportunity and the panic now caused amongst the enemy and they burst out of the caves as well, fighting on foot. So Theoden is able to clear almost the entire army with his small entourage, we don't know how big it is, it could be 50 people I suppose, um, and they clear everyone from the wall to the dike and any Uruks trapped behind the wall and, and sort of on the far eastern side, they are dealt with by Eomer and his foot soldiers. So then they then, um, Theoden and Aragorn then come together at the gate of the dike and they take counsel with one another. Because whilst they have cleared between the wall and the dike, there are still, they are still grossly outnumbered by the enemy. The enemy is now milling about on the other side of Helm's Dike, um, preparing essentially for a second charge, wondering what to do, waiting for orders. And Theoden and his entourage now stand in the gate, wondering what to do. And so as Theoden arrives to see how sorely outnumbered he is, he also finds, this is when the defenders find a great forest has sprung up to the north and blocks passage for the Uruks back to Isengard. And this is a turn up for the books for Rohan. But they don't know, is this forest with us or against us? But greater still, a moment later, on the western edge of the mouth of the Coombe, a single white rider appears atop the hill. And then coming up beside him is Erkenbrand, who has 1,000 more men on foot with him. And Erkenbrand rings out a clear blast from his horn, answering the Horn of Helm. And at that moment, Theoden and his group charge into the Uruks once more, as Gandalf and Erkenbrand then charge down the hill and hit them at the same time. And this is then the final piece of the puzzle, and the Uruks break utterly. Every single Urukai or Orc darts for Fangorn Forest, or the, come, uh, the newly come Fangorn Forest, and are never seen again. The Huons deal with them. But the Dunlendings are just absolutely struck down in fear, because I should have said that Saruman does famously rally the Dunlendings as part of his army. Um, because they have their own merit as, as opposed to the Urukai, uh, but the Dunlendings are just frozen with fear and they actually just fall to the ground and beg essentially for mercy, which is the correct thing to do because the Urukai are all slain by the trees, or the Huons to be precise, and the Dunlendings are saved, they are spared, and they are sent back to Dunland with their tails between their legs and they never ever rise again, and in, indeed Aragorn is a, a part of their survival as Aragorn requires that they basically lay down their arms and just bugger off and live peacefully and he won't bother with them when he becomes king. But the battle is then won and the the three groups then meet out on the plain with Gandalf, with Theoden, Aragorn, Legolas and then Eomer and Gimli and Gamling all ride up as well um, and uh, it's, a, it's a little moment of success for them all. But as I say, all done entirely with the strength of Rohan itself, with, with Theoden's power and might uh, with Aragorn's leadership, with, um, uh, with of course with Gandalf's coming and, and with Erkenbrand's arrival. But they don't need elves to assist them and I, and I think it, it, it takes something away in the films to be honest. Uh, but then of course it's almost implausible if the Uruks really are hundreds of thousands strong or tens of thousands strong and the Rohirrim at their best estimate there are 2,000 people in Helm's Deep and 1,000 people that come with Gandalf. So at the best estimate, there are 3,000 um, Rohirrim. And if the Urukai really do number in the tens of thousands, it is just mind-blowing how outnumbered they are. But again, it also lends itself to how strong 
Tolkien um, shows horses to be. Particularly if we do cover the Battle of the Fords of Eisen, I would recommend reading Unfinished Tales and specifically the Fords of the Eisen. Because the cavalry in, in that, that snippet, in that chapter, Tolkien makes them out to be almost superhuman. They totally change the course of the battle and they constantly save um, what would be otherwise unwinnable odds. So I think um, Rohan are really made out to be absolute masters of the horse. And so Theoden's party charging down from the Hornburg with the blast of horn, Helm's horn behind is really the, the deciding factor. But with the end of the battle, Helm's Deep then falls away from the histories altogether and it remains the seat of power for the Westfold um, but nothing else happens there to the end of course of the Third Age when all of our stories then conclude. So that concludes Helm's Deep's history and you'll note that without the actual battle of Helm's Deep it really doesn't do very much throughout much of its life but I suppose its mere presence is enough to halt the Dunlendings and it does act as a barracks or a staging point for those defending against them. But that will conclude the video. So I do hope you've enjoyed listening to this little um, charge on, on Helm's Deep. I probably will cover the Fords of Eisen or something similar in the next video. I just sort of get my idea from the video before and then and we just go wherever we want to go now, which I'm much preferring doing rather than laying out a sort of roadmap. Um, I just do whatever takes me fancy. So we'll probably will go to uh, the Fords of the Eisen next time as it, it, it lead, lends itself quite nicely to this video and I've spoken about it so much. We, I ought to. <laughs> but for now, that'll be all. So thank you very much for listening and until we speak again, dear friends, Navarre Naden Peremad Melunin and farewell.